Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. This week, we're joined by Marian Wilburn, who has been a past guest on the Garden DC podcast. She's a garden writer, garden speaker, garden book author, and garden rancher. Welcome, Marian. Hi, Kathy. Thanks for having me. Hey, so today we're talking about summer cocktails because it's one of those long, hot weeks in the summer where we have the evening storms rolling through. We just got past a tropical storm system that came through and it's a it's a good time to sit in the garden and just survey yes it is it's also a good time to sit in the garden and and weep gently over what's going on in august with a drink in your hands and then another one so (laughs) (laughs) yes alcohol helps with both of those things yeah now what are you weeping about in your garden because i'm imagining it's probably hitting its stride right now well in in a lot of ways it is hitting its stride because i use a lot of tropicals uh dotted around as accents so it is however we have had a very long period, and I think you have two of very little rain. And so for the last three weeks, three and a half weeks, it's been just bone dry. And we got some rain the last couple days, the last three, four days, and that has brightened my spirits. And I've been able to bring my cocktail allotment down by one or two. <laughs> evening. Um, but I, I have to hand water in my in my sunny gardens because I don't have piped water down there. And that is a real that, you know, that really makes you question, what am I growing? What, you know, how do the, how does this need to change for next year? And uh, but we've had a little bit of rain and things are starting to turn around a little bit. Yeah, same. My rain barrel was literally scraped out to the bottom and my pond was getting a little low. Over at the community garden plot, we water with a cistern and there were days where we were refilling the cistern almost every other day, if not every day. And normally it's filled once or twice a week. Is it a municipal filling? Do you have it done by the city? It's actually volunteers from the garden and we have a... um, hook up to the fire hydrant up the street with a meter so it's not potable water it comes straight off the meter and that's measured through it oh wow Um, so and then you have to run a long hose down the street and we were without a water in the garden for a couple days because a motorist ran over that hose that was running down the street so that that's always not a fun situation but they, uh, all the community garden watering is, is by hand watering, and it's no accident that my plot is two plots over from the cistern and not at the far corner of the community garden. <laughs> as soon as I saw that map go up, I'm like, uh, that's the plot I want. <laughs> Water is key. I mean, it's key for vegetables. I think even if you're planting drought tolerant plants, which I do tend to plant, I'm very aware of my alluvial soils. Uh, you still have vegetables that need water, and if, as long as you're planting vegetables, and then the odd accent plant that maybe you really want to plant but needs a little more water, and it gets to be an hour-long excursion in the morning, and it's not a lot of fun in the hot, hot summer sun. Yeah, and usually I'm doing all my containers, and there's kind of a triage operation going on of what you want to keep alive at a certain point. And you're like, these annuals aren't worth it at a certain point. Yes. So all in all, it's a really great month to drink. (laughs) (laughs) Both for plants and people. (laughs) So what are you uh, drinking right now? Well, I am drinking one of my, uh, this is my indulgence drink because it's fruity and tropical and I I don't tend I tend to be I tend to like dry cocktails however when it comes to a rum punch 
I really, really enjoy that mixture of alcohol and sweet juice, guava juice. Uh, I put grenadine in there, lime juice, sometimes some mango nectar if I've got it. Today I do not. Uh, but the guava really is key. That guava nectar is the taste of a rum punch. And it makes it, it's just a fun drink. It tastes great going down. It's not too thick. Uh, I don't like viscous stuff. I'm not really good with that usually. Uh, so it's just a fun, easy drink. If I if I was being a little more sophisticated, instead of uh, being tropical, I'd probably be drinking a gin and tonic right now. That's that's pretty much my drink of choice. Nice. Yeah, and I'm the opposite. I have a big sweet tooth, and I don't like bitter tastes. I but... know you have a sweet tooth. <laughs> Do, shall I so... shall I shame you in front of your um in front of your listeners? You can try, but I am. I cannot be shamed. I think you can. I think I think people <laughs> I think people might write in on the strength of this. Your wine your wine connoisseurs will at least. I am a big wine connoisseur. I love red wine. And I will say Kathy and I were at a conference uh, four years ago, maybe five years ago. And we were rooming. We were rooming together. And uh uh, you won a contest, didn't you? A, mm -hmm. um, you know the story I'm talking about, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you know what's coming. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so you won a contest uh, for a really nice bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon. And I thought, oh, hot diggity dog. I'm rooming with her. I will be drinking half of that bottle tonight with you as we sit out on our balcony and to my horror, you open that bottle and you pull out a Coke and you mix some of that beautiful nectar of the gods with a <laughs> Coke and said it was some ridiculous drink. I don't know. I don't care what you said it was. <laughs> you ruined that wine. Um, and I felt like, honestly, I should have just won the bottle and put it in my suitcase to bring home <laughs> to people who cared. So it, it, Anyone who'll put Coke into red wine, I it took me a long while to to sort of come to terms with that and, and remain friends. Really, I <laughs> you were you were so horrified. I was very yeah. horrified. So it's called a poor man's sangria, and in Spain it's called a calimoco. And I heard it's spread through most of Eastern Europe now, and even into China. And the idea, of course, is to use a cheap red wine. Uh, but I used whatever red wine was at hand, and it was free to, free to me. Hey, <laughs> and it's so travesty. it's a one, a one to one uh, uh, ratio of Coke to wine. Oh, one to um, one. It's even one worse. to one because you don't want to have too much wine. And you don't want to have too much Coke to make it too sweet. And I've actually seen a, a few bartenders' recipes where they will use a cola syrup. Um, and a red wine and then mix in a little, you know, fruit juice or something else and then a splash of soda on the top. But I think that's getting a little too fancy with the Cali Mocha. I think, you know, the classic Coke. Yeah. <laughs> you need to be drinking that with wine from Aldi's, which I have actually had some decent wine from Aldi's. So <laughs> you need to be using the cheapest wine available for that. Or yeah, the Trader Joe's two buck chuck or one of those. Exactly. I actually interrupted you. What is your cocktail of choice? What do you love to drink? Tell me it's not that one. No, no, that was that was a case of need and emergency in the uh, during the conference and what was available in a hotel room. Um, so my favorite all time favorite cocktail is a Saint Germain champagne cocktail. Oh, the, okay. that is my all time favorite. Just like a little twist of lemon, um, sh any any champagne, prosecco, cava, any sparkling wine you have on hand, and then a a generous shot of Saint Germain, which is the elderflower liqueur. Yes, I you know I had a little phase there for a while, about a year or two ago where I was enjoying just a splash of St. Germain in my gin and tonic. And then, um, and then I just thought, you know what, what am I doing? I, I just love that pure gin, that pure tonic, that, that double lime, sometimes a cucumber if I'm feeling really, ex you know, exciting. And uh, I stopped doing it. I haven't done it in a long time. I always have it as an option though for guests, if they'd like a little splash of, of the 
of it because it just pairs really well with the gin. Uh, but I do tend to be a purist with my with my uh, gin and tonics, with my pims, with these things. Uh, I, I don't like too much frills. I, I don't get too girly with them. The rum punch is about as girly as I get. Yeah, and I'm, again, the opposite of Marianne, because I like all the frills and what you would call being a bit extra. So, a bit extra? <laughs> so even when or I'm high sitting maintenance, by, yeah. <laughs> yes, even when I'm sitting by myself, typing on my computer at home, I'm going to get out the swizzle sticks, the fancy barware. I'm going to make a garnish in my glass. I'm going to take a photo and put that on Instagram, and then I'm going to savor the drink. Oh, well, I'll do that. I definitely like good glassware. I think that's really important. It, it, the drink tastes different somehow, uh, not just what the glass looks like, but how it feels on the mouth, you know, how, how that, if, is, it a, is it a skinny little edge? Is it a thick edge? Is it a frosted glass? You know, there's all these different things that really go a long way to, a, to making a, a cocktail special. So I'm all, I, I completely agree with glassware. I may not Instagram it out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't need everyone to know how much I'm drinking. Um, but uh, I definitely think good glassware. Yeah, absolutely. Investing in that. That's fun. Yeah, and before uh, listeners get the wrong idea about myself, I am a total lightweight. <laughs> one, one drink, uh over a weekend would be plenty for me. I can attest to that. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about a, an article I'd read the other day about something called the fresh air sniper. Oh, <laughs> yes. And becoming a victim of that. And I was like, that would be me. And that was a, a gentleman who was talking about spending the afternoon drinking Pims at a British pub and then feeling totally fine getting up from the bar stool feeling totally fine got his legs under him but the second the door opened and the fresh air hit him in the face he was on the ground <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that's what he termed the fresh air sniper drink <laughs> well since you bring up pims let's discuss pims for a minute because this is a drink that a lot of americans don't know about and a lot a lot of Americans who do know about it mix it completely wrong. And I need to make sure that they understand what is required of them if they buy a bottle of this stuff. Uh, so you're aware, you know, you use PIMS, right? Yes. And I, I just bought the last bottle of PIMS at, at my local liquor store, Morris Miller on the DC Maryland line for those old school folks who, who know Morris Miller. Woohoo! <laughs> But uh, the first time I really enjoyed and recall having a Pim's drink that I loved was at the Woodrow Wilson House um, in Washington, D.C., which used to be right next to the Textile Museum. And now it's next to Jeff Bezos's mansion <laughs> is, is the neighbor. And across the street is the Dutch ambassador's residence. So in good company with the Woodrow Wilson House. But they have an annual fundraiser that's a garden party where hats are to be worn and there's a, a wonderful hat contest for male female and couple and my favorite is the best outfit award so not just the hat itself but the whole ensemble and one of the caterers one year she just had put out a tray of cocktails the same cocktail but you know no labeling or anything and it was so hot and humid that summer evening in the garden I just kind of threw one down my throat and then was going to run off and take photos and then it hit me <laughs> that there was liquor in this drink <laughs> and I thought with the garnish it was just like a little bit of lemon that it might have been a um, Arnold Palmer it looked like it was just an iced tea and lemonade mix but then I ran back and I said I want a second one and you have to tell me what's in this. <laughs> and she was like, oh, before I can no longer see straight or write it. Down. Exactly. And I, will, and I will sit down for the rest of the evening now. But yeah, she said, oh, it's the classic Pimps Cup. And ever since then, I've like had to have that as part of a summer. It is. It is summer. It's summer to the British, actually. It's uh, the cocktail and it's sort of... Uh, I don't even know if you'd call it a cocktail. It's just the drink that sort of epitomizes that summer season and it is pims 
cup, which is usually almost always number one cup, there are, I think, five. I might be going out on a limb there. The PIMS number one is a gin-based special recipe, and the others are vodka-based and, I don't know, bourbon-based. I have no idea. I've never needed to explore past gin. Uh, and you mix that with what the British say, the British say lemonade, but what they mean is a lemon lime fizzy drink. Well, they mean lemonade to themselves, but to us, that's a fizzy drink. Seven Up, uh, Sprite, what have you. And that is mixed together. A lot of people, including myself, further spike it with a little bit of gin. And really? Absolutely. Absolutely. Although I think that PIMS is 25%. Per- I think. Yeah, let me pull out my bottle and look at it. It is labeled a liqueur. So when I go t- went to the liquor store, I was looking in the gin section or flavored mm-hmm. gins, and it was actually in the liqueur. So that's a little tip for Oh, that's ridiculous. Shoppers. Yeah. And it's usually because not a lot of people buy it unless you're in sort of a city area. Uh, you'll Usually it'll be all the way back in the back shelves, and it's probably been there for since 1973. Uh, but... In any case, you put that together in a glass over ice, and then the key here is having the right garnish. And the right garnish is mint, sprig of mint, and a slice of cucumber, and a couple strawberries. So that is the ultimate garnish. Now, if you're in a pub in England, they usually will just give you a slice of lemon because they don't do garnishes that much unless maybe you're in a gastro pub and maybe they'll do something more than that. Uh, but PIMS is usually served in huge pitchers and you make a big pitcher of it and then you just go around intoxicating your friends. And then that sort of fresh air sniper, I could see how that really is applicable here because it sneaks up on you. It's a drink that goes down, as my father used to say, like the devil in velvet trousers. <laughs> and and it, and then all of a sudden you're, oh, wow, how many did I have? And uh, yeah. yeah, I can see the, uh, the pitcher would be very dangerous because I've only done individual glasses mixing it. And just to uh, report, it is 25% alcohol by, by volume. So adding a little more gin, you're living dangerously, Marianne. Oh, it's a it's a lovely drink, and I you know what I never had friends here that would uh, that knew about it, and then I think about six or seven years ago went over to a friend's place and uh, he had mixed up a pitcher of Pims. I oh my goodness, that's fantastic, and I poured myself a big glass, and he had used soda water. Mm. instead of no, no, no. lemonade or seven, or seven up and it was just and I like dry cocktails but it was just such a blasphemy I, I was oh it was terrible but <laughs> I told him it was really you nice alm- you almost spit it out I huh? almost spit it out I forced <laughs> myself to drink it and another glass but it, there's a very definite taste to it uh, there's this, a definite scent to it. You just put your nose over that and it's fantastic. And it has a, a very huge garden tradition in England as well. It's about garden parties. And I mean, Chelsea, uh, flower show is about pims and champagne. Don't, it's not about, it's not about the gardens. Forget about, <laughs> it's, you know, it's a huge tents of places where you can get a, a really beautiful glass of Pims and sit there and enjoy the gardens and so it is a tradition similar to the kentucky derby where you have to have your mint julep i was going to say a mint julep right mm-hmm. so do i admit i've never had one of those Ooh, you're probably not going to like a mint julep but i'll, I'll challenge you to have one <laughs> most people it's not what you think it's a little bit stronger of course it's kentucky whiskey and mint muddled and, and ice but yeah, it's a strong drink. It's basically just over the rocks with a little mint thrown in. Hmm. So what are some other cocktails you like? Oh, I was just going to tack on to your pims and say that I actually prefer ginger ale or ginger beer um, to the lemon lime sodas. Ah. So and I think I think the ginger really brings out more of the citrus and the floral scents in the pims. 
And I experimented a, a week or so ago, and I also threw in some borage flowers, which kind of has that cucumbery oh, um, yeah. type of scent to them. I don't think that it added anything besides looking pretty to the actual flavor. Um, but the, I will caution anybody because borage flowers, you know, a nice herbal flower. But when it hit the cold drink, they looked like black spiders. So these really pretty sky blue flowers just didn't have quite the effect. I think floating on floating on top, not mixed in like I did. Don't do that. <laughs> right. Put them in cakes and or just float them on the top. Yes. Mm-hmm. Or put a, a skewer with the flowers and you just have that beautiful scent in your face. So I would say my other summer favorites are mojitos. And I, I like a really classic mojito. I love a mojito too. I suppose that's my other girly drink. Um, and the the whole ginger ale soda thing sort of comes into play with a mojito too, because sometimes I I will like it just with the soda and a nice uh, simple syrup or or just the sugar crushed into the mint at the bottom. And sometimes I'll just do the ginger ale and not worry about any extra sugar or anything. So. Um, I can go, I can usually go either way on that. Yeah, I always do make my own simple syrup from that and then get mint from the garden. And then I I love if I can source a piece of sugar cane. Um, so if you've ever had sugar cane, like uh, down in Florida, well, they'll, they'll put a sugar cane, basically a thin sliver of it as a stir stick. And then after it's soaked in the drink, once you're done with the drink, you kind of just chew on the sugar cane and so good. Oh, that sounds, uh, I, I love a mojito. I, it's a, it's a fantastic drink. It's a Cuban drink. I, um, I always, every time I go into a Mexican restaurant, I instinctively want a mojito and try to make myself not ask for one because it's just that spite, you know, that spicy food and you want that mojito and. I don't want to show how completely unaware I am that this is actually a Cuban drink. <laughs> but <laughs> and boy, don't forget the lime. And that's, don't forget that's the lime. My other, yeah, that's my other favorite, favorite part of the mojito is that refreshing lime. And I do have a friend who, when I posted a picture on Instagram a few weeks ago of a mojito I had made, was shocked to learn there was rum in the drink. She'd been drinking it for years, apparently, at, at various restaurants and <laughs> not known she didn't know what the alcohol was. I don't think she thought there was any alcohol because that I it's true that the lime and the mint does cover it up. Now, speaking of of lime and drinks and and things, Scott Berlin and I on Garden Red have been going back and forth on this vodka tonic gin and tonic thing. Where do you stand? Where whose side are you on? I'm going to say I'm Switzerland because I don't like either <laughs> vodka or gin. <laughs> I'm I was like usually rum or champagne or the pims, but yeah, or liqueur like Saint Germain, but that's about it. But yeah, I guess a gun to head. Hmm. Uh, see, I'm just not a gin. Mm, no, <laughs> a flavored vodka, like a lemon flavored vodka. I could probably do that. A lemon flavored vodka with soda and a, a little bit of mint or something in it. I have never seen the point in vodka pretty much anything. It's just to make alcohol whatever it is you're drinking. There's no taste to it. Exactly. And I maintain that you just use Everclear. It's cheaper and (laughs) it's more potent. Uh, But there are those that disagree. And most of the people who disagree are those that drank gin at an early age, like Scott did. And ended up very, very sick. Because that's, that's me as well. I did that with tequila. Um, when I was 18, I was very legal because I was in Norway at the time (laughs) and I, uh, I can, I can barely stand to touch it to this day. Yeah. Tequila is one of those that's, mm, yeah, (laughs) You, you either had to draw the line or it's your favorite drink now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about sourcing, summer summer cocktails from your garden and we we talked um very briefly about the simple syrups that we add to our mojitos which for those listeners out there who don't know i I never ever buy a bottle of simple syrup that's ridiculous (laughs) you have have at least have sugar packets right in your drawer if you even if you don't cook and have a bag of sugar for baking 
Um, but it's basically a cup of sugar, a cup of water, saucepan on the stove, stir till heat them and stir till it blends in. And then you can add whatever flavorings you want from your herb garden and then strain it out. So and one of my favorite personal ones is lemongrass. I like to chop up the lemongrass grass leaves into about two inch pieces and kind of muddle them into the simple syrup and then strain that out. Yes, I love that idea. I, and I have used lemongrass in a simple syrup as well. Uh, lemongrass is such a versatile scent and it doesn't lose that citrusy smell, you know, like uh, like citrus does. Citrus becomes very sour over time, but lemongrass doesn't lose that. It's a very resonant uh, scent, so it can add a lot to a drink. And I use, uh, I've got a new book coming out very soon, well, actually in the spring, on tropical plants. And just for a bit of fun, I have an area in the book that deals with some of the things that you can make with some of your tropical plants. And one of the recipes that I put in there is a frozen hibiscus gimlet. And that uses a simple syrup, and it uses uh, what is known as roselle which is a hibiscus uh, sabdifera, and it is a beautiful plant that is fully edible that uh, can be, I mean, it, it's used a lot for drinks, uh, but you can also use the leaves as a uh, sort of like a green. The Burmese use the leaves a lot. It's called sour leaf. But as a cocktail, I, uh, I asked a friend of mine who is just a mixologist extraordinaire. I said, here, look at this. Look at this plant. Here's the hibiscus. She, is, uh, she can work miracles with alcoholic drinks. And she took it home and created this wonderful recipe. And it's, it's a blend of that wonderful roselle red, red, red color with watermelon and that's frozen. That It's a simple syrup of the hibiscus. The vodka is also infused. So there you go. I used vodka in this. Um, and that is done into sort of almost like a frozen daiquiri, but it's that, got that gimlet um, proportion of alcohol to acid. And the acid is not a lime in this case. It's It's the hibiscus. That's the same hibiscus that's in red zinger tea. Yeah, I was going to mention, some people call it Jamaica tea or hibiscus tea. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's the same one. And it is a very beautiful garden plant. It really is. Just big sort of creamy white flowers with red throats and red stems with deep green leaves. It it, it adds a lot to the garden and you can throw it into a drink. So um, you'll have to wait for the actual recipe till the book comes out. <laughs> and what's the title of the book? The book is Tropical Plants and How to Love Them, Building a Relationship with Hot, I think it's Heat, Hot Plants when you live, when you don't live in the tropics. I can't remember the subtitle. I remember the title. <laughs> the sub, these things are out of our hands, Kathy. Yes. You, you know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, whatever the publisher took. What is it? Said, but I know it's it. Tropical Plants and How to Love Them, and it, it's it dealing with uh, tropical plants, which are just exploding in the garden right now, especially if you're in a hot and humid uh, space, and putting them into category, relationship categories. So you can learn to deal with them different ways, and you don't have to deal with them all one way. Uh, and and get in and out of relationships as you need to. So Wait a minute. So relationship-based, meaning... Uh, there would be one night stands with some of these tropical plants. There's <laughs> well, going to be I, marriages. I avoided saying one night stands. I have summer romances, which are the annuals, the tropical plants that we use as annuals. We had just have this fantastic, fun summer with them. And then in the fall, we say, bye, that was fun, baby. Goodbye. And uh, we need to feel okay about doing that. That's totally, we do that with our tomato plants. We do that with our pepper plants. And then I have the long-term commitments, which are house plants that uh, are, are tropical plants that do double duty as house plants, and they do it well. They're good house plants. They're easy house plants: Schefflera, Peperomia, etc. And then I have the um, 
oh goodness, what's my third? I have to think. Oh, the best friends are very best friends. The ones that we abuse a little bit, they take a lot of abuse and they just, they're, they're so much value for money. And those are, um, those are the, the plants that will go dormant in a dark, cool garage and, or basement or crawl space. And you don't have to do anything to them over the winter. Those are the cannas and the gingers, et cetera, et cetera and bananas and then uh the high maintenance partners <laughs> is oh okay and that is the ones that we that we do a lot for until we are just done <laughs> and we don't want to do it anymore i'm very familiar with some of those plant relationships um especially the ones that maybe you want to forget about some of those past affairs huh yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, I, I think so. Those are the, those are those high maintenance. That you think, why did I do this? Where, where am I? What universe am I in that this? What is was okay? I thinking? Yes. Why do my <laughs> window sills look like this? And uh, you want to get rid of them? No, it's it's not to necessarily get rid of them. It's to decide which ones are going to work for you and which ones aren't, and and the extra that you have to do to make that happen. Um, and then I do have a fifth relationship just for fun. And that was the friends with benefits. And that's where my hibiscus cocktail comes in. That's where things like using banana leaves uh, to wrap and steam food or as table settings or to uh, use things like the roselle and stews or to use your gingers and your turmerics and those type of things. So it's fun. I think it's it's a memorable way of of thinking about tropical plants and it also it, i hope that it expresses that it communicates the fun you can have with these plants because they really do start to power up the garden right about now and things are flagging i mean i'm sure you're seeing that in your garden mm -hmm. and do you grow roselle in your garden i do i have it i have it both in an area that the deer can get to it uh but they tend to leave it alone. They shouldn't. It's a hibiscus. They should be eating it to the ground. And then I also have it in the vegetable garden. And do you start from seed or plant? Because I do know that Southern Exposure Seed Exchange down in Virginia sells a seed pack of it. And they their variety is Thai red. So I didn't know if that was the same one you're growing. No, I don't have Thai red. This year I got plants um, from our mutual friend Ed Aldrich, who had who grows it every single year. I believe that his grandmother was Jamaican, and he grew up with a, a rich history in this plant. And and so this year he gave me some plants because my seeds did not germinate this year. I had seeds that I'd taken off of a friend's plant in. Uh, Virgi uh, Southern Virginia, and they never came to anything. So he he threw me a lifeline on that one. Uh, but I, d you can also get them from Baker Creek Rare Seeds and Southern. And I, I think that theirs is just Roselle. I don't think it's Thai Red. Uh, but it's very easy to to sprout I as long as you've got good seeds, and then to save your own seeds. Excellent point. And I'm looking at the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange listing now, and they're listing it as a frost tender perennial. Oh, yeah. Uh, it It is a frost tender perennial. I don't know what its, what its uh, low temperature would be. My guess would be 30 Fahrenheit or, you know, maybe 25. I that would be my guess somewhere in there 20 25 30 but it is uh, definitely very very frost tender the minute you get a frost it's going to wilt those leaves but you can bring you can bring it indoors but it's one of those things that it's i i treat it as a summer romance it's something that is very very easy to start from seed so why not and it grows very quickly from seed you can have a very large a shrub from seed. And I think a lot of people forget, think about your tomatoes. Think about, I mean, think about a tomato plant that started from just a seed. Plants can get that big. <laughs> a really good example of that is papaya, um, carica. And 
you can scoop out the seeds of papaya from a grocery store. You're not going to get exactly the same papaya that you're holding in your hands, but that's okay because you're not going to get the fruit anyway. But what you will get is a 15 foot, very tropical looking tree by the end of the season. So, you know, th th that's another summer romance. Plants can grow quickly. Yeah, and that kind of sounds like monster proportions for me, for a, <laughs> a small space gardener, but that's great for filling in. Yes. Uh, the first time I saw that was up at Chanticleer, and uh, they had accidentally stumbled upon uh, Carica because somebody, they thought it was from, it was in the compost pile where somebody had sort of thrown their lunch and went, wait a minute, this is an incredible foliage plant and let's grow it. But if you're if you're focused on we need the fruit, you're going to be disappointed because the fruit will start to, you'll get the flowers, you'll get the tiny, tiny little fruit by the end of the season. And then dun, dun, dun. That's right. You live in the Northeast or Mid-Atlantic. <laughs> and there will be a frost. And there will be a frost. You can kiss it goodbye. <laughs> so speaking of edible flowers like the roselle and others um, where do you land i know you said you're a bit of a cocktail purist but on the side of savory versus sweet so you know i have the sweet tooth but i was looking at a basil mojito recipe and i was thinking will i like that maybe with my lime basil or lemon basil but i don't know if i'm, I'm ready to make the basil leap you know, I have, I've tasted a basil mojito. I didn't love it, but I think that a lot of that is because if you really truly love a cocktail, the way that it's traditionally made, a gin and tonic, a mojito, a pims, uh, and, and you, I mean, you're committed to that. It, it's very hard to try it with something different. Now, if you're not committed to it, it's just another fun flavor. It's something cool. I think that's the reason that Pims and ginger ale is just, to me, the biggest heresy you could ever think of. <laughs> uh, because I, when I smell Pims, it's, it's not just that drink. It's the memories of that drink. It's the history with that drink. And, and that's what happens with any type of cocktail, if you're, you know, if you've been drinking it for a while and uh, getting up in years and, <laughs> you know, uh, so a basil mojito to me, uh, I, I, I didn't enjoy it, but I think that had that been the first mojito I'd ever had, maybe, maybe I'd feel differently about it. Yeah. See, I think I'm much more experimental in the sangrias. Like there's tons of different, you know, white with peach, uh, red with some of like the fall fruits or a rosé with some citrus. I think sangria is you can really stretch and have different combinations. Um, as long as you add a liqueur, like a brandy or a contra or something to it. Cause I'm always like my, my biggest pet peeve is it's not a sangria. If it's just flavored wine, <laughs> that's not a sangria. Right. Yes. That's a wine cooler. To, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, you know you're going to have to put your money when you're, where your mouth is when we next meet up in person and, and show me some of these drinks and, and how well you drink them. <laughs> Maybe not the how well I drink them part, but the, I could certainly mix them up. Um, one other flavor I was going to ask you about, because I love cilantro and love I growing it in the shoulder seasons, but I'm starting to see a lot of summer cocktails using cilantro. And I have to say that might be my line. <laughs> that might be the, the I'll, I'm willing to try a sip of almost anything, but that might be it right there. Well, you know what I might suggest to you, Kathy, is instead of having the fresh leaves, if you're trying a cilantro drink, would be to crush the root. And the root is not we, we don't really think about it a lot, but we really should think about it because it has that lovely pungent cilantro taste, but it's a little milder and it's, it is still viable when the leaves have bolted because as you know, cilantro is a, a cool season plant. And so uh, you could maybe just get a hint of that coriander cilantro cilantro is, is coriander but you could just get a hint of that without going full blast into salsa drink <laughs> yeah that's what i could see 
I could see maybe, uh, and that gives me a, a reason to pull it out at the end of the season besides cursing the insects that have chomped on it. Yes, the insects love it. The heat, uh, it hates the heat. Uh, it's about time right now in the garden to start putting some seeds in for the fall. In fact, we're getting close to it being too late. So it's time to start putting some cilantro seeds in if you want to have some cilantro in, in the cool fall months. Yeah, if only if it was a, a tender herb that actually could keep better, aside from the seeds, of course. But yeah, it's so hard to keep. Do you put yours in a glass and put it in the fridge? I have after I've cut, you know, a handful and done it that way. But still, it, it you know, it's not a long lasting plant in the garden, even with a cover cloth over it to try to keep some of the insects down and try to keep some of that heat off of it. No, but boy, it it there it flavors so many wonderful dishes, uh, curries and salsa and oh yeah, I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. <laughs> I just love like a cilantro rice, which is another Cuban dish. Cilantro rice, yes, yeah, so good. My husband is not a fan. He thinks it tastes like stink bugs, and I can give him that. I I totally can see that, but just like. I smell a boxwood and I adore that resinous scent, but my friend smells cat spray. I can recognize that, but I don't share it. So I, 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 <laughs> I love my boxwood. I love my cilantro. <laughs> I'm going to go cilantro. Yes. Boxwood. No, but, <laughs> and I was going to say that maybe your husband might actually like a stink bug or two mixed in. You you can, Oh, he <laughs> would lose he would lose his ever loving mind. I swear that man probably was killed by stink bugs in a previous life the way that he reacts to them. So no. I think that wouldn't be smart. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for your own self-preservation. Yes. <laughs> well, doing a little 180 uh from the herb garden and summer cocktails on the veranda. Uh, to talk about your latest article for the American Gardener magazine for American Horticulture Society. So it just hit my mailbox yesterday, so great timing with the July-August issue that came out. And you have an opinion piece in here called In Defense of the Lawn. I do. I, I suppose I have to say my opinions are not necessarily those of the magazine, blah, 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 fine print, fine print. <laughs> Um, but yes, I do. Um, I, I, and I, I, and I hope it's going to spark a little bit of a discussion, truly. Well, what's funny is last week's episode of the Garden DC podcast, I had a short um, piece that I read on lawn alternatives. Now, I did not prescribe ripping out all your lawn, <laughs> but to at least consider reducing the size of your lawn. Right. And, and you know what, in practice, that is certainly what I uh, have done in the past uh, in my smaller garden. It was all lawn when we first moved in. And by the time I was gone, we had to, we added a little tiny bit of like 15 by 10 foot for the kids so that they could roll on it. But I landscaped the lawn right out of there. I don't want lawn. I'm a gardener. I want plants. And I wanted every single square inch of that place to be about the plants. Uh, but I am I have become more and more aware as I've gotten older that, that you and I and all of the people who are in horticulture are, we're a funny people, you know, we're, we're not the normal. And a lot of people not only are completely cool with their lawns, they do not have an aptitude for trying to create something else and they don't want to create something else. But we are trying to force that on them. You get rid of your lawn, put in a meadow, get rid of your lawn, put in a perennial bed, get rid of your lawn, put in native plants. And we're, we're telling them to do something and shaming them for having a lawn when they have no aptitude for it or desire. And I think what we need to be doing is having a different conversation where we're saying, look, we acknowledge you love this, this grass. You love its versatility to play games on, for the kids to run on, for the dog to run on, for entertaining, however it is. But we don't need to deal with it in this 
horrible chemical warfare state of mind. We don't need to treat it all the time. We don't need to constantly be applying things that are very, very poor for our environment. So we need to have a conversation where we're acknowledging that uh, and helping them to find a way to deal with their lawn in a more organic, better for the environment way. And, and it, it, instead of just saying, nope, plant this instead, plant this instead. Because I will say, as you know, like I said, I've, I've been a garden columnist for a long time and people don't, there's a lot of people who just don't want plants Anything above four inches is a royal pain in the butt. And am I allowed to say butt on your podcast? <laughs> but Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, but also, uh, just as a one-time landlord, that was a fascinating thing to me because uh, we had uh, folks, they were really lovely people, lovely family who moved into our last house uh, before we sold it. And they uh, loved the garden, absolutely adored the garden, didn't want anything to change. I tried to make it a little more low maintenance for them. Nope, they wanted that. They were not gardeners, but they loved the garden. But after a year or two dealing with that, uh, I would come back to the place and it would just be a nightmare, just chaotic nightmare. And the only thing that was taken care of was the the lawn in the back that was mowed they knew how to do that they knew what to do and they also had me to ask any questions that they needed i, I you know i was always there and ready to go uh, so it's not as if there wasn't the knowledge there for them but they just didn't want to deal with it and uh, you know as a gardener it's hard to respect that because I live, sleep, breathe, eat plants, literally, when it comes to hibiscus. And I, it's hard to understand that, bottom line. But it, that's the way it is. A lot of people really, really don't want to do plants the way that I want to do them, the way you want to do them. And so we need to have a conversation. I, I know I keep saying that, have a conversation. But truly, that really is, you know, we need to talk that way rather than yelling at them that they need to, you know, go have their meadow when they have absolutely no desire for a meadow. They'd like to have a meadow in another person's yard <laughs> where they can just look at it, but they don't want to take care of a meadow. Now, some people do, and I, and I want to make that clear. There's plenty of people who do, and so that's why it's a conversation. So you can, so you, you know, you're not passing judgment one way or the other. This is evil. This is good. Let's just say, hey, this is a good option. Let's do it in an organic way so you can have the lawn that you want. Mm -hmm. And I would think that with all things moderation, uh, you know, it, it helps not to be one monoculture of any plant, whether it was turf grass, bamboo, um, what have you whatever it is, it's the monoculture that's, that's really the objection. Yes, it is. And, and that's what happens, with, especially when you see some of these HOA subdivisions where they expect perfection and people kill themselves to do perfection. And it becomes maybe one or two species of, of turf grass. And I mean, my lawn, I have a lot of lawn, quote unquote, lawn now. I have a lot of grass now in between my cultivated spaces. I'm on a much bigger property. And that, I, I can't even, I, I don't, it would be interesting to count how many species in a, in a square foot. And maybe I'll do that, actually. Maybe I'll do that. I'll put write that down as something to do. Because there there are so many, and I've got everything from Carex growing out there to clover to Claytonia and violets and erythronium, and there's just so many different things out there. And it all gets mowed, and it gets mowed at different times. I don't want to ruin that Claytonia display in the early spring. Uh, and the bees adore the clover flowers right now. Uh, which is fantastic because, you know, summertime, there's a, a real dearth of nectar. So uh, it's a, it's a, a multi-species 
lawn. And, and that's what we need to look at for people and to say, hey, clover's okay. Clover was one of the, the actual lawn, uh, what would you say, suggestions back in the 50s and, and 60s. Clover was in the mix, in the seed mix, but now clover is evil. You can't have clover. Well, yeah, with the broad spectrum pest, you know, herbicides, it hits the clover just as much as the other. And if you had a big clover patch, then you were a little dismayed <laughs> when that when that happened. So they had to convert you to a full turf grass. Yeah. And uh, Paul Tukey, who... Um, who wrote the Organic Lawn Care Manual, which is an excellent book. I highly recommend it. He talks about looking at our lawns and diagnosing them based on what they're telling us. You know, not just, okay, let's apply the chemicals, but look at your lawn. Do you have a lot of plantain in your lawn? I can say absolutely in one area of my lawn, huge amount of plantain. And that's because the soil is so compacted. That's what plantain likes. So if we want to fix that, no amount of chemical, I could, I could spray that plantain every day of, of the year. And that particular plantain would die, but plantain would grow again from seeds coming in, in another place because they'd find a perfect habitat in that compacted, strong soil. Uh, so you have to change the conditions and you can do that gradually with your lawn and, and feel a lot better about what's sort of dripping off into the bay and not dripping, but running off and what your pets are eating and what your kids have got their faces in, you know, <laughs> and, and, and the big input of gas and oil usage. So if you can switch to electric, if you can switch to man-powered, even better. For a small space, yes. Um, you do also have to realize, you know, when you switch to electric, you are merely switching to whatever your electricity board is powering their electricity with. That might go right back to a fossil fuel. It's not necessarily cleaner. It might be, but it, it's not necessarily. So... Uh, especially for, for a smaller lawn, like for instance, I have a little battery operated um, lawn mower that I mow my pathways with because if we take the big mower in there, it just destroy it throws grass all over both of the borders. I don't want that. So a, a very easy uh, battery operated is, is perfect for me. And I did for a long time just use the real mower, the you know, the one that that takes no gas and no electricity. The R-E-E-L, real mower. Oh, that's for the real, <laughs> the real, real mower, yes. The real, real mower. The yeah. real, real mower. So I look forward to the letters to the editor coming to American <laughs> Gardener. Hopefully, hopefully they do too, yeah. They, there might be a few. Mm-hmm. And those who are interested in commenting on the Garden DC podcast uh, can do so either to my social media at WDC Gardener on Twitter and Instagram, or they can send an email to Kathy Jens at gmail.com. And how can listeners contact you, Marianne? Uh, they can contact me at Marianne at smalltowngardener.com, and that's M A R I A N N E. You just go to my website, Small Town Gardener. And uh, there's a contact form in there. Or you can also contact me through Garden Rant. I think you can contact me through Garden Rant. Uh, pretty sure in the About Us section. Gardenrant.com. That's Gardenrant.com. And, and while you're there, bring a cocktail because you'll probably need a drink as you go through all of those rants and <laughs> <laughs> all the opinionated gardeners that are there talking about the, the various things that annoy us or... Uh, elevate us at any one time. Yeah, I do love that Garden Rant is not just negativity, that there's also inspiration and things you'd like to see more of in the gardening world or people to focus on. Yeah, uh, I think they do a really good job of, of trying to uh, do a little bit of everything uh, from different viewpoints. And I actually, I think we're going to run an excerpt next week of the lawn article. So if you're interested in it and you're not a member of AHS, if you're not a member of AHS, shame on you if you're a gardener. Um, but 
uh, the editors of, of uh, the American Gardener, which is the publication of AHS, are offering a discounted membership uh, to Garden Ramp uh, readers during that time. So that link will be on there. Uh, and I urge you, and nobody is paying me to say this, but truly, if you're a gardener in uh, America, it is an excellent, excellent organization to belong to. It, it deals with both coasts and everything in between, all different regions, I, all sorts of really fantastically educational articles. And that's becoming rarer and rarer. You know, things are sort of an inch deep nowadays. We don't get to delve deep. And that magazine does that. And also, it's got the Reciprocal Gardens program, which right there will save you money. I, I made up my membership one year so easily going down to the Fairchild Garden uh, down in Florida, the, the botanical garden down there. And I think it was like $30 to go in. And it was part of the Reciprocal Gardens program. And that meant my $35 membership at AHS was returned almost in full and so worth it and they call it the rap rap program that's right and uh they recently changed their web address a couple years ago so if you're looking for ahs.org skip that one and go to ahsgardening.org yes and they and they do many many different things for the community to promote horticulture it's not just about what you can get out of that membership it's what they're doing with that uh, with that money and it's it's good work it's good work hopefully they won't get too much flack for this article <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully it'll bring out as you say a conversation yes yeah absolutely well thank you Marianne thank you Kathy it was, it was so much fun I drank uh, a full rum punch while we were talking oh no and uh, I may just mix myself another who knows I was gonna say don't let that fresh air sniper get you <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know and, and it will too because I've left all of my gardening chores today to the evening because at this time of of the year I'm sure you're the same it's got to be done by nine o'clock or I start gardening at around seven o'clock so yeah this is the time of year where long days really pay off but uh pit helmet with a little lantern on the top isn't a bad idea either it's a it's a great idea and i fully expect that the next time you and i get together uh that you will put your money where your mouth is on some of these cocktails and you will not force <laughs> me to buy you that horrible coke cabernet <laughs> that you did it'll be cali mochas for everyone <laughs> <laughs> Gin and tonics all round. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Marianne. And we'll have you back soon to talk about your forthcoming book, All About Tropicals. All right. Thanks, Kathy. For this week's What's Blooming in the Garden, I want to share another one of those ephemeral joys. This time it's my green cloud lotus. It's a container grown lotus that I have in a large pot next to my pond because should it be in the pond, it would expand to the entire water garden. Uh, the green cloud lotus is classified as a medium to small lotus. And it sits in about a three foot size pot for me and grows about two feet tall. The bloom this past week was dazzling. It's a creamy white color with a green blush on the petal tips. But it gets its name Green Cloud uh, because the tips of the pistils are bright green, almost chartreuse, and they're held high above the white flower. So that gives its appearance of floating inside a green cloud. Uh, if you don't have a container grown lotus, I highly recommend it. It's one of those things that kind of sits and has beautiful foliage, movement. The insects love it and like to pond or 
sit on the leaves and drink the water. So you'll have some enjoyment that way with butterflies and dragonflies visiting. And also honeybees as well, I found, do that. So set up a sitting area pretty near that container and you'll enjoy the foliage throughout the season. And then when it has those one or two, maybe even three if you're lucky, glorious blooms in a season, you'll know why. This is one of my favorites to add to your garden. Plant profile, cucumbers. Cucumbers belong to the same family as melons, watermelons, squashes, and gourds. They are a warm weather vining plant that is grown for its refreshing and mild tasting fruits. They are sensitive to the cold, so the seeds should not be planted until the soil has become warm enough for them to germinate, usually in late May to early June. Form a soil mound and plant a few seeds in the top, then water them well. The seedlings will sprout in a few days. Once they develop their true leaves, you can then thin them to the strongest couple of plants. While the seedlings are young, protect them from birds and insect pests with a floating row cover until the plants start to flower. An organic vegetable fertilizer can be applied after the plants start to bloom. The cucumber plants do best in full sun with very good air circulation and soil that has excellent drainage. You can let the plants sprawl on the ground or train them on a trellis. Trellising improves air circulation, keeps the fruits from ground-dwelling pests, and makes it much easier to safely harvest the cucumbers. The cucumber patch should be kept mulched, weed-free, and well-watered. Cucumber plants produce the best-tasting fruits when they are not subjected to water fluctuations or drought. The most familiar cultivars require pollination in order to set fruit. They are usually monoecious, meaning that each cucumber plant has both female and male flowers. If you find that the pollinators are not doing their job fast enough for you, you can hand pollinate the vines by plucking off a male flower and marrying it to a female one. You'll recognize the female flower as they have a tiny fruit at their base. There is no need to prune cucumbers if you are growing them outdoors, and studies show that removing the leaves actually results in a smaller harvest. Cucumbers should be harvested as soon as they are ready. Otherwise, they will quickly lose flavor, grow too large, and can become tough. For more tips about growing cucumbers, see our cover story in the July 2017 issue of Washington Gardener magazine. Cucumbers, you can grow that! Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter by going to anchor.fm backslash Kathy dash gents backslash support. For as little as 99 cents a month, you can become a listener supporter and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Another way to support Garden DC is to go to washingtongardener.com and subscribe to Washington Gardener Magazine. You can find Washington Gardener online at washingtongardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.